please join me in giving a warm welcome to all of our panelists and our moderator, uh, Derek Kaufman, where is it, Tom Curran, and uh, our moderator, Dave Holmesy. First of all, thank you guys for bringing this back. I mean, Sonny was an incredible human. He's the guy who ran up to me on the cliff at Piahi and stuck a camera in my hands and said, hold this. I'll be right back. I got to get more film. And I didn't know who he was. And he's like, I'm like, hey, wait, what's, what's your name? He's like, Sonny Miller. And I'm like, the Sonny Miller? Like the guy who did all the search films? Yeah. And at that moment, I was just like in awe. I was awestruck. I'm like, oh my God, it's my hero. And from that point on, Sonny and I just had this great relationship. And I worked with him all over the world. He took me under his wing and just an incredible human. And I'm so thankful that Derek has done what he's done now to bring this back. And, and Tom, it's always been a pleasure seeing you all over the world too. And you know, you're an incredible human. It's great to be up here with you guys. And um, you guys wanna say anything? I just thank you for being here. I'll ask a few questions, but do you have anything you wanna say or? I wanna thank you, Dave. And, um and Derek and uh, Sarah for having us here. Thank you all for, for coming and uh, um, um, celebrating uh, surf filmmaking and, uh, and Sonny Miller in particular. And um, we miss him and, uh, and we want to shout out for Nalu Films and, and what, what they're doing. Yeah, mahalo, uh, well said. <laughs> Yeah, Dave summed it up really well about Sonny Miller. Um, he, he was an amazing human being. Um, some of the trips that Tom and I were uh, blessed to be on, um, like that Mozambique trip, you know, we were on a sailboat for six days sailing and just seeing the land not moving. Um, and, you know, it's easy to get some negative thoughts. Uh, what are we doing here? Uh, can we go home? Did Derek Hines send us on another goose trip? Chase, uh, but Sonny always had that mindset of positivity and smiling, and I think he helped transcend a lot of our trips to kind of get through some uh, tough patches. Um, obviously, back in the 90s, there was no internet. There was no forecasting. You just kind of, you know, hey, let's go in this window, and, and hopefully we score. Uh, we were obviously very blessed to score some really good waves on the search. Um, Anyway, I want to ask Tom uh, a question, and I asked him this other day, uh, but uh, Tom, what's, for you, what's kind of a, a special part of Hawaii um, that, that, that is that memory that you, that you kind of mentioned to me about uh, that, you know, kind of your first opportunities in the ocean? Um, is, is there anything you want to talk about that? Well, uh, my, uh, uh, some of my best memories were 1970 when we came here um, vacation and uh, I picked up surfing. Uh, I got a, a board um, and uh, brought it back to California and kept surfing. So, um, so that was uh, very important for me. Yeah, and you were mentioning that uh, Makaha, right, was one of your first opportunities to uh, catch a wave. Do you remember like that that experience, or how old you were, or, or you were? I know you were with your dad. Did you have any yeah. recollection on that? That was um, I don't know what beach it was, but it was around there somewhere around um, some kind of white water waves, you know. Um, I remember it was with uh, the uh, the Trent family. We were we were with them and um, on a Trent was the one who was showing me how to surf. So that was that was really cool. Oh, so Anna Trent gave you some uh, pointers back in the day. I didn't know that, that's good info. Yeah. For sure. Hey Tom, what was one of your, font, like what was, of that entire film, if you could say, what was one of the, what was one of the moments of that film, one of the highlights or the trips like maybe the bow on the fish or any any of those I don't know what was your favorite part of that journey well that was uh was filmed around uh over like about a three year so years uh so it um the probably the the best um time I guess overall would have been that when we were at Jeffrey's Bay the first time um 
and uh, we got to stay there for about a month. And uh, that would probably be the biggest highlight for me. Yeah, and speaking of that trip, uh, you wrote a lot of different boards back in the day. Um, you were, you know, I know Derek Hein was kind of bringing you a, a bunch of different uh, different boards to try. Was there any ever any particular board you felt like you were attached to? You seem to just kind of be able to surf on anything in from any shaper, really. Um, is is there anything you can mention about just the the board design and all the different shapers you got to try different crafts? The uh, <clears throat> the time at Jeffries was was really cool because Derek knew all the shapers around and and he had a bunch of boards, and I tried a bunch and um, I remember the the best board was a Peter Daniels and and I only got to surf it on one wave because it broke on that on that wave and so it was like it was, it was like a really good board. Um, but there were others. Um, Mark Rabbage was uh, was uh, his board was one of my favorites. Derek, how did you get into this? How did you get into surf cinematography to begin with? Like, what wow. what drug you into this world? Um, interesting. Well, I I grew up in Waimanalo, and then my dad we moved to Hawaii Kai when I was young, so. Sandy Beach was right there. So at a young age, I was kind of turned into like Sandy shore break and um, just body surfing, boogie boarding, you know, just experimenting. Um, and I had actually a good friend of mine, Richard Chesky, gave me this little yellow Minolta uh, happy snap. And I remember because he worked at Fox Photo, and I remember just taking it out and just clicking. Uh, and he was like, "Well, bro, you got some pretty good shots." And you know, like, "Oh yeah, that's that's kind of cool." Well, that was actually my first time ever shooting. Um, and then I was very blessed because a, a good friend of mine, I grew up with Mike Prickett. We went to high school together. Uh, Mike really uh, influenced me a lot. Um, I think I hurt my leg or something one day, and he's like, oh, Hoffman, you should try shoot with my camera. And you know, back then you had Sentry, like manual focus lenses, and I was like, oh, this is kind of tough, you know, trying to get a shot and focus. And then he's like, you should try a housing. So I swam out with one of his water housings, and... From that moment on, I kind of was clicked into the water uh, photography and uh, moved out to the North Shore at Prickett in the 80s um, and kind of got more into motion. Got actually one of the first 8 millimeter video cameras in a housing and just kind of, uh, you know, honed my craft, so to speak, on the North Shore. I was blessed to work with a lot of great filmmakers, Bystrom, Dietrich, et cetera. And then I met Miller. Uh, well, actually, I met Miller at the Gotcha Pro in Sandy's behind that, but... Anyway, I was so blessed to meet Sonny, and he called, I'll never forget, he called me, he goes, Hoffman, uh, yeah, you want to go on the search? And this was after the search one, when Tom and them scored good J-Bay, and he had an opportunity for getting another cameraman in, um, and I was just like, oh, yeah, where are we going? He goes, well, here, in the, you know, three months with Kern, I'm like, sign me up. I hang up the phone, and someone's like, how much is he going to pay you? I'm like, uh pay me like you know really no this is a lifetime so back then it was obviously nothing about money it was just the stoke of being able to travel around the world and document some of the best surfers in the world uh with a guy like sunny as you know he's traveled so yeah, that's how i got into it dave thank you same for me sunny kind of did the same thing for me let's go and it was one of the best experiences i mean i miss the guy every day an incredible human elvis how many how many times did he dress up like Elvis on your trips? Yeah, no, I think it was. I don't actually know. Uh, we did we did actually. We went to a disco party once. But I don't think I don't think he had an Elvis costume on. It was a disco era. I felt like every trip I went on, he had an Elvis costume. Yeah, you remember that, Derek? Yeah, Miller was the costume master, like Captain Miller, and you know, it was like we were saying, he had such a vibrant personality, um, just very outgoing, gets along with anyone, and he made it fun to be, you know, some of those trips, we were on a boat for like three weeks, um, you know, you don't really touch the land, so uh, you can only have so many bintangs where you have to bring some other excitement, so Sonny had a lot of excitement. He could, he had have a lot of bintangs, for sure. And another thing I admired about him, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but you would get on an airplane with him and you would sit down and he would just go instantly, the whole flight, gone. I don't know how he did it. I don't know what that guy had. It wasn't drugs either. There was no Ambien back then. It was just straight up. He had this ability to just knock out. And then he would be on fire the moment we hit the ground, full on. Yeah, I think it was a lot. He had a lot to do at the 
ticket counter. That was always a big, yeah. a big. Uh, yeah, he did. You know, physically taxing, I guess too. Yeah. So he probably was just resting that. At that yeah, time. and that that smile always just got us through everything. It was yeah, incredible. and speaking of those uh, tickets, you know, I mean, you you know, you normally go to check in. Okay. Two bags, couple couple board bags. What do you got there? And I mean, when we traveled on the search, we had like ten cases, and you know, it'd always be like extra baggage. It'd be like, oh, you owe us four thousand rand. I got no money. Where you know, it's so funny. I'm like, wait, aren't we shooting for rip curl? But we never really seemed to have any money. But we kind of pulled it off the whole the whole way. Um, and I think that was a lot to do with Sonny's. Just charisma. attitude, charisma, personality. All attitude just got it's us sweet, through everything. Sweet, sweet talk, everyone. So, um, wow, yeah, we got some good stories on Sonny. But um, does anybody have questions? Is there any questions from the audience at all? Hey, Derek. Uh, maybe you know this, but Derek, you probably How many waves were ridden in the spill? <laughs> Randy, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> In this film, how many waves were ridden? I, I can't even guess. A couple, 300, 400? That's a great question. Did you count them? <laughs> did, did really? You, did you try and count the edit at the end with all the turns? Yeah. So and and it just right another there. thing of the editing. When Sonny edited this movie, he was living in La Costa at the time, and I, I'll never forget it because he, you know, back then to edit, you, you didn't have a computer. I mean, you had. We had the origins of uh, nonlinear. I believe it was either uh, the first Adobe Premiere, like one, or the Media 100. So uh, that was the first nonlinear. But what I, my point was, you used to use Betacam deck. So you literally had to put the Betacam deck in and find the shot. Whereas now you can find it all digitally, right? Oh, there's this, this, and that. So it was a lot of work uh, to actually pick out uh, all the best shots off that uh, those waves. But that's a great question, Randy. Now I'm going to have to go watch the movie and count all the ways. <laughs> yeah, Randy, that's a good question, too, because um, a lot of times with creative editing, you know, if I'm going into a quality turn and then I d do something bad at, right after, you can just cut it right there. <laughs> that, that's why I asked how many. <laughs> One other question for Tom. Tom. The only contest that you won here in Hawaii was the Wild and Hawaiian Pro at Hollywood, and there was footage in, in the film of that. And it was amazing because uh, my friend John here said he didn't have his OP logo on that board. And what was the story of why he rode that Morris Cole board with no logos? Thank you, Randy. Uh... <laughs> I get that question before. Um, that was uh, the, the the stickers didn't show up, and the heat was going to start, and I was like, okay. And so I didn't uh, use the stickers. And then after that, I thought it was like a, I was a little bit superstitious about it because I was, you know, I did well in that heat, so I was like, well, I'll just not put the stickers on. But it was uh, it was not a good decision, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you won that contest at, in the world title that year, so. Do you have a question in back, right here? I, I got a question. Oh, can I go? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, this movie was a really good way to, like, study your style, um, since it was all year, right? Um, I noticed that when you're coming down the wave, you do this, you always, like, turn your head away from the most critical part of the wave. <laughs> do this quick like and one you know and it's a beautiful thing it's like you're always just like turning away from like the head or the, so it's way right behind you you just and um one are you are you conscious of that and two do you who is your like most influential surfer maybe that you emulated mm -hmm. um so i would have to check that i guess maybe you know you kind of my eyes were sensitive, so the, any kind of white water, I'd be like. <laughs> or was my hair? Uh, I don't know. Who knows? But anyway, the um, and then I was um, I really like Rabbit Bartholomew a lot. Uh, it's like I 
um, got to hang out with him in France a little bit. And then, um, so I got a, a, a just kind of like, I just liked the way he served and he had a, you know, kind of a, <clears throat> he had a, like a combination of aggressive and, and, uh, stylish. And that's kind of what I was, was, um, you know, I thought that was really cool how he, he did it. And among others, of course. Thank you. <coughs> and this is for Tom. Um, this movie is what 20, 25 years ago. I'm just curious what your days look like now. That's uh, they don't look like this though. It's, <laughs> um, I live in um, in the sort of coastal mountains, uh, kind of about thirty or so miles from the coast and uh, uh, in a real quiet part of uh, the central coast. And uh, I'm enjoying that, you know. Uh, I prefer being in the ocean all the time. And so this is something new. Um, and uh, I do a bit of traveling um, and uh, still get to travel and surf and do still get to do some of the search uh, type of things. Do you ever get a chance, or do you know anybody that has a property at the ranch and a relationship with on there? Yes. Uh, um, yes, I get to go to the ranch sometimes, but I haven't been there for, for a few years. Uh, but it's a great spot. Anybody get to go to the ranch is one of the... Uh, one of the nicest places to go. Um, yeah. It's nice, yes. 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 Um, what's your favorite surf spot in the world? Um, well, I, I would have to pick one. I think I would say Sunset Beach, just because it's, um, you know, it's got, uh, it's, it's challenging. And it has a you know kind of different mood for different swell direction, and um, <clears throat> I like the I like the um, you know it, it can get crowded, but I like uh, I like the crowd. You know, there's kind of a you know um, there's all kinds of people surfing it. So I, if I had to pick one, I think so that'd be sunset. Okay. Yeah. Hey Tom, uh, I know music's a big part of your life, and uh, I was curious who picked the songs for the soundtrack. I love that soundtrack. I remember I had the VHS tape, and I actually recorded it on my little tape recorder serving <laughs> or before I was serving. That's a, that's a uh, yeah the the songs that was Sonny uh, who had all that um, but yeah his uh, tape recorder is a little machine that <laughs> it has a little thing and it's called a tape and uh, you can press the record button and they wind up like that um, <clears throat> yeah the Sonny um, was uh, yeah he was hands on with that too so he did all the editing and the, found the music found the bands and uh, you know, a lot of them are Australian bands, and so that was pretty cool. Like we got to meet a lot of those guys. Yeah, and following up on that question, um, just a little factoids for you. The first song uh, is called "Magic Man" um, by Pico, as an Australian musician, really good friend of Derek Hine. That song was made for this movie. The first opening song, "Magic Man." Um, there's an African beats in there. Um, I'm not sure which segment, but uh, we were in Africa and Sonny bought a cassette tape and put it in there, and part of that's in there. Um, we didn't clear that, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> but we did clear, uh, and there's uh, another, uh, another um, Arno Kimsey. So Arno uh, was a musician who actually created some original of the, some of the music is actually original. Uh, the opening is Arno. And Tom actually played the drums 
on uh, some of the tracks. Uh, not so much, I think, in this particular film, but some of the other Search films, uh, Tom played the drums, and uh, I think he even played guitar in some of the songs. Um, so Sonny was really good at just kind of connecting the right people, and it seems like people kind of gravitated into him. So that's a little backstory in that. Bagpipes never fail. That's the thing. <laughs> I guess that that that's you know I mean I would say bagpipes wait, but then yeah once you hear those bagpipes you know something, you know it's like oh bagpipes yeah that <laughs> that that band is actually three brothers I can't think of the name off the top of my head but it's just another really eclectic style of music and uh, that Sonny was really good at uh, just kind of piecing them together with the footage. And what? Oh, so uh, I have this five five that I really like. It's uh, it's really flat and thin. It's got a lot of edge on it, and it's a little softer in the in the front part. And I like the edge in the back because it just it it gives you that extra speed. And then the the front part, you don't really want the edge because it actually uh, it does something weird. Like it kind of uh keeps you on kind of keeps you kind of projects you out like that too much so you can't really hold in so if you put a little softer edge in the front it's a little better no no i have a, yeah i sort of have a quiver to <laughs> pick and choose um i got a um a, a big paddler like a 12 foot paddler that i uh, reshaped it broke in half, so I glued it back together and then reshaped it into a, like a standard surfboard rail. And that's at the glass factory right now, so I'm looking forward to getting that. So that'll, that'll be, be fun. fun. <laughs> this is a question for all three of you, actually. Um, what is your The, uh, the 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 new sur films are more exciting for me. This is you know I've it's it's kind of yeah, it's a bit much you know it's it's kind of <laughs> like it, but um, sur cinema is is I think where it's at and uh, you know surf movies coming to the theater again. I think it's a, it's kind of a um, it's kind of happening you know. And there's so much good new stuff out there too. Yeah, I really, I'm, I'm just happy to see people back in the theaters again. It's really great to have this experience. And um, I'm up and down. I'm, I'm still, I still love shooting film so much that all the digital stuff out there these days. Sometimes I look at it and it just, it, you know, and the stories are great, but the imagery to me, I think a lot of guys are doing stuff with digital that just kind of takes away from the beauty of the film like I don't want to get too technical or into it but I just I really just miss film and I want to bring film back as much as possible that's kind of what I would love to see more of I know it's hard but I I've done it and I'm still doing it a little bit here and there so just trying to keep that ball rolling yes and on that note uh, we have an archiving company because back in the day when we shot a lot of film we you had to like hand you know load the camera so you're actually touching the film you, you have to load it uh, whether it was a daylight load um or you're in a bag and you could get anywhere from three to six minutes on your reel so you know now what you can shoot forever um forever Forever. So back uh, when we shot these films, uh, you were really limited on how much time you could shoot. So you, you weren't just shooting everything. You were very selective. I mean, obviously, if Tom's on a wave, you're rolling on everything. But you were very selective on who and what you shot. Um, so And it was a lot harder, as we were talking about, to edit back then because you didn't have the phones or computer editing. And it was just the infant stage of nonlinear editing. And it was really tape to tape. 
And um, so a little side story, when we would go on the search, you know, we'd have a rip curl backpack full of film and that thing weighed 50 pounds or more. And that, that was like, that's the gold because you have to take this film, you got to get it through all the x-rays, get it to, let's say you're going to Africa and shoot that film and you may get some of the best waves ever, but you don't even know because you can't watch it back. It's on, you look, it looked good through your viewfinder. You're like, hopefully. It Sometimes it looked good through the viewfinder, <laughs> depending on the camera. Yeah. yeah. So other times you're like, what is it? It was always this hit or miss, uh, wondering, did you even really get the, the footage? Um, and uh, I just remember one story in J Bay it was the second year uh, when Brock Little was there. And I'll never forget it because me and Brock were traveling back and Brock's like, I got it. Because he was like, who's taking the bag of film? I mean, it's like, that's it, right? You, you, that's the most important thing. And um, anyway, just thinking of Brock a bit on that. But I remember Brock, you know, he's, his arms are flexing. He's like, I got it. And he's like, through the x-ray machine, you're like, we couldn't let anyone x-ray it. We had let him look at the film through a bag and feel it. Uh, so if I think about like today with the digital, which I love, like Dave saying, it's beautiful, but it all kind of looks similar. This film, as you notice, the looks are all over the place because you could have different film stocks, right? You maybe you exposed it a little improperly, whatever. It just everything had a little feel to it. Uh, surf, uh, what, do we, what do we call it? Celluloid film, celluloid. You know. Um, and on a quick note, um, so what I was going to say, following up on Dave's question about this film, it's it's. It's cost prohibitive to have these old movies and or tapes and look at them. So uh, part of our mission was to actually start an archiving company to be able to take all this old footage, turn it digital. And more specifically uh, with the film, we can now take the old film. So you can actually touch the film Sunny Touch, loading the camera, load it in and turn it into a digital file. So the filmmaking, I believe, is the same as far as trying to capture these incredible images and angles. Obviously, you have drones and different things. But I feel the art of filmmaking, as, as Dave would know, um, is, is just, it's kind of a lost art. So it's, it's nice to uh, see these types of films. Yeah, it is. And I'm really looking forward to diving back into that archive. I mean, I did trips, numerous trips with Sunny um, throughout Indonesia that has never seen the light of day. That hopefully one day we'll be able to bring those images back to all you guys and edit something together that'll be fun and yeah i'm really looking forward to diving into that soon or whenever <laughs> whenever possible but yeah there's there's a lot of footage out there of a crew of incredible surfers back to back to back to back to back that has never seen the light of day so yeah yeah that's, gonna that's a good note that's and gonna that's, be fun that it is fun and uh and in and, and sunny's archive is vast I mean, obviously, there's incredible footage of, of Tom and, and the search, but you, you know, you got the origins of foil boarding, toe in with Laird and, and Double D, and just there's so many historical stories. Uh, that's part of our goal is to is to bring a lot of these back. Um, so anyway, thanks, Crystal. Oh, I got one. <clears throat> he um, he would always make fun of uh, people who were like less less sort of I guess positive as stuff. He would say, "Oh, it'll never work." So that was he, he would always say that it'll never work, you know. So because he was a guy, he was really he would make it work. He was really uh, he never gave up. He never ever you know it didn't matter. The camera could be just fried film coming out of the sides of it. Like he would figure out a way. I remember dismantling something with a captain on one of the boats and him and the captain just got in there and just ripped the thing apart and figured it out and put it back together. And this is an old film camera too, like old motors and trippy stuff that I'd never seen before. And Miller always just had, you're right. He was the most positive guy that I'm of a quote or something, a memory. I remember, I remember standing on top of Krakatoa's cinder cone he was dressed like Elvis. <laughs> I, I, wish I, I wish I had that photo. He's just dressed like Elvis, and he's hitting golf balls back towards the boat, trying to hit the boat that was anchored down below. That was Sonny. He was just always out. He was a pirate at heart, 100%. He could drink 20 bintangs, and he'd still be going. It didn't matter. He was good fun, always. He was good fun. And we, I kind of nicknamed him MacGyver Miller uh, before that. 
particular instance. Like I remember I we were in J Bay one time and I was like, some wire popped out of something. He's like, don't worry, we're going to go to the hardware store, buy a soldering iron. And, you know, he was, he could fix anything anywhere in the world. Like, uh, I can just have so many different thoughts of him late at night, whether it's in Claw's house one time when we were having a spring load in one of the Bolexes. He was, his, he had a very analytical mind. His father, by the way, um, Bud, he was a uh, work for NASA as an engineer. So maybe that was part of his. Yeah, uh, he had he had that DNA for sure because yeah. he could he could fix anything. He really could, and he wouldn't give up until it was yeah until it was right. Um, I think we have a question over here, Buzzy. What influence did skateboarding have in your career? Um, were you ever able to go into any any of the drainage ditches over here, like Wallows or Uluwakus? And uh, do you remember what type of skateboard you? Bro. Yes, uh, skateboarding in the sort of late, mid to late 70s in our area was uh, a, a lot about the longer boards and Sims. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, kind of sponsoring a lot of the, the, he had a team and a lot of my friends were on that team. And um, we used to go up to this place called the the T bowl it was a giant reservoir. We it was a, like a it was like a pool, but it was really big. So we yeah we did skate a lot in the summer. Uh, Tom, I'm curious about the competitive side, your competitive nature. Three world titles, you seem so not a little key, but uh, you, were you born with a, a, a name? competitiveness for a world-class you know athlete or was there a lot of nurturing and I want was curious also how did that stack up to your more soulful um, self-expression as uh, love just pure love of the, the sport so the self-expression versus the competitiveness did you nurture both of those did you have to work on both of those uh, well um, they I guess the competitive part would have been from uh, like junior lifeguards and swimming, uh, high school swimming. Um, and then um, being able to compete at surfing and do well, that kind of, you know, it helps. I got, I got good results around 1977, started to do well. And so I was focused more on that. Um, and, uh, as far as like uh, style, technique, I was working on that too. Just kind of sort of keep ev everything where it's supposed to be, I guess. Okay. Al Merrick uh, was a huge part of uh, of w why I was able to do really well, and um, and um, the um, sorry, what was the first part again? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Al Merrick was a huge part of of everything. Uh, you know, not only did he shape my boards, he was helping me with um, managing and stuff. He would he even glassed uh, a few of my boards. So he was um, he was very influential as a, a person. And uh, you know, surfing as a gift. <clears throat> it's uh, it's amazing. It's a gift from Hawaii. That's how I look at it. And uh, I always try to remember that. Okay. Yep. Time. Did you say? Did you say time? One more question. Is that we can get time for one more question? Okay. For fourteen years, we've been at these film festivals where they look back typically Bud Brown type movies, and always. There's the, the legendary father, Pat Byrne, in a lot of these films. I think Ben asked you a question about the influence that maybe Red Bartholomew had 
had a time. What was it like growing up with a worldwide, you know, pioneering big wave surfing iconic legendary father? And what influence did he have on you in general? Was there a pressure that meant to you a lot? Was it pretty attached to surfing your own thing? I don't know the relationship between you and dad that way. The um, earliest memories, I think, well, some of my very early memories of a scrapbook of Bud Brown film, um, you know, pics of my dad surfing at the bay, you know, and so the most famous one with him and um, Peter Cole and Byron Cole, and they and my dad comes through the pack, and it was like a, you know. He did so much like that, and I mean, uh, um, you know, the way I look at it, and then maybe other people would see this differently, but my dad, you know, he kind of, this might sound weird, but he kind of showed uh, everybody how to do it, you know, at, at the Bay. That's really what I believe. Uh, not only that, he showed people how to do it with the board building. And he lived his life, you know, um, true to what he believed, you know, and uh, and um, I guess I would just, you know, not, not uh, people grow up without a father and and stuff like that. But I, I was uh, I had a father and uh, um, just the. Um, just the person even right up until the end, you know, just the, um, you know, somebody who you, you can just, some, somebody special. Thank you, everybody. All right.